welcome. You may be seated this morning. Once more, welcome to all of you to Sunday morning church. Welcome to those online. I usually forget the people that are watching us online, but we want to say welcome to you if you're, if you're watching this morning. Glad that you guys are all here. And today's a special Sunday. I mean, every, every Sunday is special because we get to gather as a church for the purposes of worship. But today we celebrate communion. And it's an integral part of the Christian life to celebrate communion. So I want to make sure you guys, in advance, if you guys receive the little cups and the little juice, get your hearts ready for this. And before doing so, we're going to read the word and go into the word and, and study the word so that when we come to communion table, we understand what we are doing. So I want you to turn your Bibles over to the book of John. Once more, we're still in chapter 6, in the beginning 15 verses, and what we've been discussing lately is this miracle event that happens in John chapter 6, one of the most famous miracles of Jesus Christ. It's mentioned in all the Gospels. It's the feeding of the 5,000 plus women plus children. This is a grandiose event in Jesus' life. And what Jesus does here is a proof that he can satisfy human need on both levels, spiritual and physical. So I want to make sure that that's clear because if Jesus Christ is only an idol for us, if he's only something that we carry around in our necks crucified, then Jesus Christ really is nothing, and we should not even waste our time on Sunday morning. But he's alive, and he fulfills and satisfies all of our needs. Last week, what I want to kind of just remind you about, last week we discussed, we ended on this concept of testing. So prior to getting to the miracle, we, we see that the disciples begin to get tested. Now, I want you to see the time frame or the chronological order to this miracle. They're in a deserted place. They're in the wilderness. They're, nothing's around them. No, no commercial business is around them. And prior to the miracle, we have the testing of the disciples. When Jesus asked the disciples, how will we feed this multitude? How will we give them to eat? They're hungry. It's in the afternoon. They are in hunger. And how will we fulfill that need? So prior to the miracle, we have the setting and the testing. And what I really want you to get this morning is if you are a child of God, if you are a disciple of God, and if you believe that you are truly a believer, then believers get tested. Christian life is a life of testing, and get this, my friends, by God himself. Oftentimes, we blame the devil for everything that goes wrong in our lives. The devil made me do it, or it's the devil's fault that I don't have a job. It's the devil's fault that my marriage is failing. It's the devil's fault. It's the devil's fault. But oftentimes, we forget that God is the one that does the testing, because God knows the heart. Because God knows what's going on deep inside and therefore wants to bring that faith out of his children. So friends, if you're going through testing, you're often in the best hands possible because it's God the one doing it. And so these disciples are tested. How will we feed these people? But when we get into that verse, if you go with me to John chapter 6... Verse 6 says the following. He said this to test him. He's talking about Philip. For he himself knew what he would do. So the testing doesn't end on the disciples. It goes back to Jesus. Why does Jesus test them? Because he himself knows what's going on. Our attention is focused back on Jesus. His disciples don't know what's going on, but Jesus already knows what's happened. And the way the grammar is set up in this verse is giving us the insight that Jesus doesn't know only what they will reply. Jesus knows the beginning from the end. 
The grammar pulls us out and says Jesus knows. And that verb, it's, a, it's an exaggerated verb that reminds us that Jesus knows beginning all the way to the end. Because he is alone sovereign and omniscient. And that goes to show what we believe in Christ. If we believe that God through Christ knows all things, then we should really ponder what that means for us. Think about it. Everything that's going on wrong in the world, everything that's going on wrong in your life, if Jesus knows, then what's the deal? What's the issue? Why isn't he doing anything to fix my problems? Why isn't he doing anything to stop all the pain, all the hurt, all the, all the suffering, all the poor people, all the hungry people? If God knows, then why doesn't he do anything? So this, my friends, when we read this verse, it pulls our attention and our, and our theology into this crux in life. Does God really know? Does Jesus really know my life? Does Jesus really care? And so in this verse, what we discover is that he does, and that he does know, and that he is watching, and he is able to perform and achieve the miraculous. So what, that's the, the purpose of this verse, this little parentheses that we get in this verse. It's to remind us again that Christ knows. He knows your life. He knows my life. And sometimes that's a good thing, and sometimes that's a Bad thing, especially when we do that which causes sin against the Lord. But after this brief testing, see how the disciples respond. In verse 7 and 8, we get the following. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? So we immediately get a human response to the dilemma, to the situation. How are we going to feed these people? Well, if you ask a human being, if you ask even a disciple of Christ, they're going to react purely on human instinct. I mean, Philip sees the need. Philip sees almost 20,000 people sitting on a hill and realizes to himself, even if I had eight months worth of salary, which is what this translates to in modern times, even if I had these 200 denarii, it wouldn't be enough. And that's an exaggeration. To Philip, I mean, one denarii was what you got in a day's work. So this is an exaggeration of 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 a, a human response. Even if I had all the money in the world, I couldn't do this. Even if we did have the money, we wouldn't even be able to satisfy them a little. That's the pure human response. This money could not provide the need for these people. And that's what Philip tried to get Jesus to see. Even if there was a rich man in the crowd, think about it. Even if there was somebody that was rich, that had the money to buy a lot of food, where would he get it? They're located in a desert. So what the Bible is trying to get us to see here and what John is trying to get us to see through this working of Jesus' miracle is that even human, a human response, which is typically our response to everything, right? When there's a problem, we just throw money at it. Money will solve all my issues. Money will solve all the problems in the world. However, here, with this exaggeration of eight months' wages, Philip realizes that even that would not provide even a little bit. Now, I want you to remember that little because we're going to see the contrast in, in a little bit. A little. It won't even provide a little. And so for Philip, the problem was hopelessness. I mean, the problem, the answer to the problem is literal 
hopelessness. We, we, we just can't do this, Jesus. We don't have the means to provide. And then Andrew, another one of the disciples of Jesus, says, well, hold on. We do have something, but what we do have at this particular moment will not be enough to feed all these people. Now, what do they have? They have two fish and five pieces of bread. Now, it's interesting that here in the Synoptic Gospels, we don't have the story of this little boy. I don't want to bring too much emphasis over the little boy, but they don't mention this detail. Once again, John puts this detail in to see the reaction on a human level. This child that comes in to to, to bring the, the material or the source to feed the people, his gift is not enough. It's really insignificant. The, the word for child is really a word used for a servant or a servant boy or a servant young man. Kind of bringing us that the child himself is insignificant. And what he brings is really insignificant, comparing it to what Christ will do. So what the gospel is trying to get us to see in these immediate reactions is the things that this world typically go to, the the answers to life's problems that the world typically goes to, will not be enough. The fact that John mentions that it's barley bread, it's, it's really... It means bread of the poor. This is what poor people ate. This is poor people food. It's kind of like, you know, the peanut butter and jelly. You know, even though I love peanut butter and jelly, but if that's all you got, that's all you eat. Or or maruchan. For those that lived, gone through university and gone through college, you know that, I mean, at least I survived the maruchan for about two straight weeks of my life. But it's poor people food. And this is what's being provided. And so what Andrew sees this, He says, this food cannot feed the multitude. It's not enough. Philip says, money is not enough. Andrew says, the food is not enough. Why? Because the need is too much. That's why Andrew's immediate response is, what are they for so many? So he too sees hopelessness. I want you to pay attention to what's going on. Philip and Andrew, and we can rest assured that the rest of the disciples have also identified the fact that there are too many people to feed. In both cases, the disciples figure out the need is too big and the resources are too few. However, the disciples are responding to the need of the people without one crucial Subject. And that's the power of God. The way they're supposed to respond to the need is to understand that God is in their midst. Now it's difficult, right? I don't know if you've sat next to a loved one in your life that is in the hospital and maybe going through a very difficult treatment. Maybe they're on their deathbed. Maybe they're about to die and they can't even respond. And you're sitting right next to them and you're telling them that you love them and you're telling them that God is powerful. And you're there in that moment and you just realize, I I can't do anything here. The cancer has spread through the body and there's nothing left to do. The only thing that we can do is will and wish and hope that God can do something in this person's life. But regardless if he does or he doesn't, the disciple rests on God's priority and God's decision. And so the disciples forgot about that part because it's normal. I don't want to blame the disciples because the disciples would, we would respond in the exact same way. We would look at the 20,000 people and say, there's just no way, man. I I can't get enough White Castle burgers for all these people. It's just not going to happen. Like, it it just can't. 
Because it's, it's a normal thing. And that's how we respond normally when we're going through difficult situations. It, it, God, maybe, but it's just an impossible aspect. What God is calling his disciples to do is to trust. Even a little in the hands of God can bring abundance, not for yourself, but for others. And so the insignificance of this child, the insignificance of his, of his offering, the insignificance of money at this moment has nothing to offer. It is what God does through Jesus Christ. It is what happens in the hands of Christ that does the miraculous. It's Christ that does it. It isn't us and it isn't our efforts. It is our faith in God to provide and to fulfill the need. As a pastor, I've had to have difficult conversations with people that have lost loved ones and that have lost their mother or father. It's difficult. What do you tell them when they, when they ask you, why did God take away my brother? Why did God take away my mom? Why did God take away my dad? It's difficult to answer. But the common biblical view to that answer is, though it hurts now, God will give you strength to overcome this moment in time in your life. You're going to get through it. I don't know how. And there's no words I can really say. I just trust that God will get you through it. I just trust that God knows what he does. And when he does do things that we don't like, it's his prerogative, not ours. But we rest and confine in that God that is good will get us through. And so, friends, even in our current dilemma, in our current situation, God will get us through. And so this difficulty in life and this difficult situation that just seems too hopeless is contrasted then by what God does. This is what I love the Bible because the problem and the situation has been presented, and now who's going to feed the people? Well, if we look at verses 10 through 13, I want you to read that with me. Start on verse 10. Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given things, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left and those who had eaten. So this is the miracle. Did you hear it? It's immediate. We have this entire setup of almost 10 verses in chapter 6. And in one little verse we get the miracle. And this is going to lead into the main point of this, uh, uh, of this miracle that I've been mentioning since the beginning. Because the miraculous part of this is not only the feeding of the 5,000, but what Jesus will do forever. The feeding that Jesus will do forever is the main purpose in this story. So in the middle of this hopelessness, hopelessness the disciples of Jesus tell, uh, uh, tell Jesus it's completely impossible. And then Jesus immediately responds and says, let's prepare the meal. And the literal word he uses in the Greek is hanapipto, which means recline at the table. When he tells them to sit down on the grass, what Jesus is really telling them to do is sit down as if you're going to recline at a table to eat. So if you're going to, if you're about to dig in with your fork and with your knife, that's what Jesus is telling the people to do. And what he's telling the disciples to do. So can you imagine the disciples' response? And like They're looking around. There, there's no table here. There's not enough food. Uh, what are they going to be doing? Are they, are they going to pretend to be eating the fish? Are they going to pretend to like eat the, the... Like what are they going to be doing? Jesus is preparing and anticipating what will happen. He's getting them ready because he alone can provide. And so Jesus goes into action. 
And so when we read about this grass, it isn't anything significant in, in itself. It just shows us the details that John the writer gives because he was there. Can you imagine being there present when Jesus does this amazing miracle? And it serves us to know that the disciples immediately get to work after the miracle is done. Read with me once more. Verse 10, Jesus said, here's the miracle. Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about 5,000. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. Immediately, there's the miracle. It wasn't like Jesus did like this crazy, uh, ma magical, I don't know, something like Netflix would do, right? It's none of that. What Jesus does is immediately grab the little and multiply it, and then he tells his disciples to serve or to get to work. In verse 11, the context of the setting is, is intricate and vast, but the miracle itself is just summed up briefly. So John presents the enormity of the problem first and then the simplicity by which Jesus deals with the issue. What does Jesus do first? He gives thanks. Read verse 11 again. Jesus then took the loaves and when he had given thanks, what does this mean? Jesus recognizes that all things come from God. In contrast to the disciples who turned to their pockets or turned to what they had in their hands, to their human resources. They assessed their own abilities to meet the need and therefore became discouraged. Yeah, of course you're going to be discouraged when you realize you can't do it. You can't. That's why we are Christian. That's why we're disciples of God. Because we can't do anything. Paul says, I can do all things through Jesus Christ. It's a famous verse. All the athletes wear it. It's tattooed across people's face. They forget that it's not you, bro. It's Jesus. Jesus is the one who does the miraculous. Jesus is the one who does the work. And so Jesus recognizes that it comes from God. We, like Jesus, here's the lesson, should measure what is possible, not according to our resources or what we have or what we can provide, but according to God's power. By looking at him, we find encouragement to meet the greatest needs. We don't have anything, friends. We don't have anything good to offer. It is by God's power we can meet the needs. Then what do you do next? He gave thanks first, and then he distributed the bread and fish to all who were seated. In the synoptics, the disciples are recorded as distributing the food. And here, it's kind of taken for granted that they do the exact same thing. However, John notes that Jesus alone provides the meal. In the other, like Luke and Matthew... The, the disciples are the ones that are distributing the, the, the food. They, it's immediately said that they're the ones that are, are taking the food to the people. But here it's Jesus. Because John wants to remind us again, and I'm going to belabor the point because John belabors the point, that it's Jesus the one who does the providing. You can't get that confused. You can't forget about that. You can't forget about the abundance, that it comes only from God. And so what we learn is that this cheap, this cheap bread and few fish were offered to Jesus in faith. When the need is much and the resources are few, we know that the Lord will provide. So as disciples... And as followers of Christ, and if you're here this morning as a Christian, you understand that you trust in God's provision, not yourself. You don't look to yourself. Christians don't look to, their, to themselves for their own way out of difficult situations. Try it. It may work sometimes. Most often it doesn't. 
Disciples look to God for their provision. God will provide. Now, Jesus satisfies the need in verses 12 through 13. And I love how it contrasts with the little. Remember at the beginning, uh, Philip says, it won't even provide a little. Now look at what verse 12 and 13 says. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled the 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. Jesus fulfills the need and then goes to prove that the way he does it could never be met by what human possibilities or resources could do. If human resources could even scratch the surface of meeting the need, it'll only be a little. Jesus gives in abundance. It overflows so much so that 12 baskets are left over. This provision is abundant. His supply is abundant and it never ends. Certainly the Lord can and will always satisfy his people. His abundance stands once more in contrast to this miracle in the desert with Moses. Remember this Moses figure where the people only took as much as they needed for that particular day, but they couldn't take any more. Jesus is the better Moses. Jesus gives more bread. More so because even it overflows to fill the 12 baskets. Now, there's a lot of numerology going around in the Bible when they look at certain numbers and they kind of make stuff up about the numbers. And when we see 12 baskets, sometimes it's very hard to kind of like make a theology of the 12 baskets. But it's mentioned in all the Gospels. And the only thing that we can really look at about the 12 baskets that were left over is the fact that it reminds us of the 12 tribes of Israel in Egypt and in the Old Testament. And it's just a reminder that God provides for his people. If you're his people, if I'm his people, if we are God's children, God provides for our need. But also this abundance in supply points us to the later discourse that we're going to be reading in John chapter 6 on being the new manna from heaven. That's what this title of this message is called. Jesus is the new manna. His heavenly bread is eternal and is enough for us all, especially if we're his people. The physical bread that was provided would satisfy their hunger temporarily. But they will go hungry once more. If feeding the needy is the central aspect of Jesus' ministry, then once again, why doesn't Jesus make enough food for everyone all the time? If this is the only thing we're supposed to look at in this miracle, that Jesus gives bread to hungry people, then why doesn't Jesus do this all the time? Then why doesn't Jesus just make a humongous piece of bread and, and make plenty of fish in the sea so that everyone can eat all the time whenever they want and have an abundance? Because that's not the need. Even though it's a human need, it's not what it's drawing our attention to as Jesus being the manna from heaven. It serves us well to know that these signs are not his end goal. For many do receive the Lord's material blessings. You and I are aware of that. Many people have received blessings from the Lord. But it is possible to walk your way to hell with a full and satisfied stomach. It's not about what God provides you physically. It's what God provides you spiritually. It's the food that you eat spiritually that we must really understand. So this abundance also points us to God's abundance of grace over sinners. And friends, when we get to the table in a couple seconds, we're going to understand this. This abundance demonstrates God giving and giving even to people like you and me who do not deserve any of it. But he gives with abundance. It overflows with grace for us. Even And he demonstrates his overflowing abundant love for people like me and you. It wasn't only what Jesus can provide at that moment, but what he provides for eternity. 
So as the band comes up, friends, we're going to spend some time doing the Lord's table today. And I want to remind you that the new manna from heaven, Jesus as the new bread from heaven, will provide for your eternal soul. Something that material things, as Andrew tried, will not fulfill. Something that money cannot satisfy. It is God who comes in to give us grace and love. I want you to stand with me this morning. And as we get ready for this, this time together in, at the Lord's table, I want you to remember that true disciples are sustained by God's spiritual abundant provision. The reason you and I can continue in Christ and can stand strong in Christ and can live our life in the middle of a sinful world is because we are sustained by Christ. You're a Christ, Christ un, Christian, because you're sustained by Christ. You're not fighting to keep your faith alive. God's fighting for you. God's given his abundance for you. God's going to provide for you for eternity. God watches over you. God provides for you. God loves you. God gives grace to you. And his love overflows in abundance, even when we don't deserve it. So friends, as we sing this song, I want you to prepare yourself for the communion 